everyone, this is Kalimara here, and no, it's not Calamari. Welcome back to the channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. So, you've probably seen the thumbnail and title, and you're probably thinking, what the hell? Why is Danny Gonzalez's face in your thumbnail? Is this a collaboration with Danny Gonzalez? And what does any of this have to do with telekinesis and psychic powers? And they are all valid questions, but perhaps I want to be a little fiend and not answer any of them. But that would end the video right here, so I should probably start clarifying. Almost three weeks ago, Danny Gonzalez posted a video called I Tried Learning Telekinesis to See If It's Real, which I immediately watched because I am truly Greg and I watch all of Danny's videos. But this topic hit especially close to home because when I was a kid, oh boy, I wanted so bad to have some sort of psychic powers just because I wanted to feel special and different from the other kids. And yeah, I'm not ashamed to admit that I watched and practiced so many how to get telekinesis videos on YouTube and spent a disgusting amount of time taking what psychic powers do you have quizzes. I grew out of it, eventually, and I turned out just fine. But that phase will forever be part of my history and Danny Gonzalez has drudged it back up to the surface and more. I don't know how, but his video managed to touch on not one, not two, but three major experiences in my childhood in his video without really meaning to. And for some reason, they both involved blindfolds. In his video, Danny mentioned a quote karate school that did blindfold training and a learning center also in quotes that did the same thing, and I have actually attended both in my childhood. Not those exact ones, but something similar in Indonesia, which I will put a pin in because this becomes important later on. So I actually have first-hand experience with the stuff Danny talked about in his video, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about in this video, as sort of an addendum to Danny's video. And Danny, if you're somehow watching this, I promise I'm not that mad and I'm not a weirdo, so please collab with me. Just kidding. Unless? <laughs> no, seriously. Before we get into it, please take everything I say with a grain of salt, because I was under 14 years old when it happened, so some details are extremely fuzzy because it all happened over a decade ago, okay? I don't do this stuff anymore, I promise. For this video, I'm going to go through my experiences in chronological order. So I'm going to start with the Psychic Learning Center because I distinctly remember being enrolled in that course shortly after my family moved back to my hometown when I was like 8. It's not the exact same organization as the one Danny talked about in his video, but I think it's pretty much the same thing. It was called the Genius Mind Consultancy, and I know that for certain because my child brain really clung to the genius mind aspect of it because it made me feel like a very special little girl. But googling it now, literally the only things that come up about it are articles talking about how it's a scam, so we're off to a great start already. It was like a three-day seminar thing, and the way it was pitched to parents was that it was a brain activation course to help kids learn and study more effectively at school, which was the reason why my mom enrolled me in the first place. Not that their kids would suddenly start developing supernatural abilities by the end of the course, but I guess that was like some added bonus to some parents. But somewhere along the line, and by somewhere I meant as soon as my parents paid $200 and I actually set foot in the seminar on the first day, it, it just took a sharp left turn. Because the first presentation I watched, they talked about changing our mindset, thinking outside the box, and not being restrained by a narrow perspective. Normal enough, I guess, even though I'm not sure how well a bunch of 10 year olds would be able to understand that. And then, I distinctly remember how that all shifted to energies and how humans actually have super mind powers, we're only using 10% of our brains, including, but not limited to, 
sonar like bats. Of course, they will be helping us cultivate these abilities and put a pin in this as well because it's a running theme that shows up again later. But even back then, my child brain was like, but what does this have to do with doing better in school? But of course, because I was a child who always wanted superpowers, that thought easily got drowned out by the prospect of finally starting my superhero training. And I'll be honest, I had a lot of fun attending these seminars. In the first day, we were mostly doing brain training games, quizzes, and hand-eye coordination activities that helped you with fine motor controls, which made enough sense. Looking back on it, I can see how ha having a flexible thought process could help you understand subjects in school better. They also gave us this worksheet to do at home that was... I don't know, questions to analyze our mindset and some Sudoku. But then the second day, oh boy, <laughs> that's when the blindfolds came out. All I remember that day was walking around with blindfolds on and being told to see the room and navigate without eyes and then having to guess the colors of papers. And I don't remember much of it, because my eyes were covered the entire time so there isn't much to recall in terms of sight there was this one kid they brought in who was like an alumni from another branch they had done and he was reading a full-on book with his eyes blindfolded just like in danny's video which was why i was thrown for such a loop and even back then in my head i was like Maybe he memorized it, or maybe he's like peeking from underneath the blindfolds because that's what I was doing if I was tired of getting the answers wrong and wanted to cheat. But at the same time, I was also very competitive because I wanted to do that too, damn it. I wanted to be special so bad, it was disgusting. And at that point, there was literally no way this would help you do better in school aside from, I don't know, bragging rights, inflating a child's ego. But at that point, I also did not care about my academic performance. I was doing this for me and my superhero career. Because back then, and maybe now still, I fully believed that the whole experience of brain activation was true. And I shamefully kept the blindfold they gave us and wore it at home and to sleep because they told us it would strengthen our psychic powers for months, even though the dang thing was way too tight and it gave me a headache after wearing it too long. But I was determined. And as proof that I didn't just make this whole thing up, here is the certificate I got for completing the seminar. I do think that although the course was definitely a load of baloney meant to scam hundreds of dollars from poor unsuspecting parents at worst and full of unproven claims at best, it was ultimately a fun, harmless experience for the kids who got to feel like they were special little snowflakes with superpowers. Just kidding, these people were literally putting kids in blindfolds and throwing them into very precarious situations like, I don't know, walking a plank across a pool or riding bicycles in crowded streets. They didn't do this in my seminar, but they did show us videos of these other kids doing it in their presentations and dude, I ate that shit up. I was genuinely like, Oh hell yeah, let me walk around blindfolded around a pool and ride a bike in a busy street. You know, because I was a child, being fed very dangerous ideas. And looking at all these pictures, these kids were definitely cheating. Look at them! They're literally peeking from under their blindfolds while my dumbass was fully convinced I could do it. Like. I could actually do it for real. <laughs> but it didn't stop there, oh no. On the third day, I clearly remember they brought in another alumni kid who they said could literally sense illness in people and heal them with a touch. I'm not kidding. 
I distinctly remember the staff were explaining that he could seek out the illness using his psychic sonar, the one that they were trying to develop in us in this course. And it helps him like travel inside the blood vessels and nerves of people, locate the issue and fix it with his imagination. And I real I literally remember that there were like the parents were there obviously waiting for their kids to be done with this goofy little seminar and they were like letting people in and letting this kid like treat them or whatever and they were just like oh yeah no it, it worked it, i don't know if they were paid actors or if they genuinely believed that it worked but i ah, okay i was so jealous of this kid <laughs> And I swear, anywhere else outside of Indonesia and possibly Southeast Asia, this would not fly. But Indonesia is very culturally superstitious and especially susceptible to mysticism. So everyone there was just like, oh, hell yeah. Or maybe not, but I sure was. And I was so ready to get those powers myself. I never did, of course. Or did I? But you know what? In the end, I genuinely believe that I got smarter and opened my third eye after that seminar. So was it really a scam? Or maybe it just inflated my ego enough to believe I was smarter and that helped me focus on my studies more? Who knows? They were supposed to hold more seminars to further develop our abilities or whatever, but they never did, you know. Probably because they got exposed for being a scam. But yeah, that was my experience with the Psychic Power Development Center. I'd like to thank Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring this video. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are monthly Japanese subscription boxes that give you a taste of Japan's culture. With Tokyo Treat boxes, you will get up to 20 of the latest, most exclusive, limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan for a limited time. Meanwhile, Sakurako offers authentic, traditional Japanese snacks that support local Japanese snack makers. Each box comes with 20 traditional, authentic, and artisan Japanese snacks, including Japanese teas and a special Japanese tableware. Both are delivered straight from Japan to your door. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako's boxes come with different themes every month, keeping things exciting and fresh. Spring is almost over in Japan, but you can still get a taste of the Sakura season from the comfort of your own home. This month, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are inviting you to join in on the Yuzakura experience, which is the Japanese tradition of viewing cherry blossoms at night. The beautifully designed cherry blossom box contains exclusive and seasonal snacks that won't be available once spring is over. Indulge in the unique flavors of Hanawarabi mochi, Sakura ame, and Sakura sweet potato from Sakurako, and treat yourself to Piccola Sakura matcha and Sakura cherry bush from Tokyo Treat. This is one of my favorites. It's a mini plum and Sakura mochi that literally tastes like the most satisfying jelly bean ever. The Yuzakura experience is the perfect way to celebrate the end of spring and immerse yourself in the beauty of the Sakura season. But time is running out, so order your box now before it's too late. As always, I'm super excited to receive my snack boxes and I will definitely be keeping the pamphlets and boxes long after I've finished all the snacks. Which is very soon, by the way. If you want to enjoy pop Japanese snacks, you can choose Tokyo Treat, but if you want traditional Japanese snacks, you can enjoy Sakurako instead. Oh, that's so good. Now, if you're hesitant to try foods that aren't familiar or you can't read the labels on the packaging, the boxes also come with a booklet that explains every snack included in the box, including any allergen information. You can also learn about Japanese culture. Thank you so much to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring this video. I genuinely love their products and I'm always excited to receive their boxes every single month. And if you're interested in getting your own subscription, then you can use code Kalimara to get $5 off your first Tokyo Treat order or use the links in my description. And if you use the code Hanami, you can also get additional bonus items in your box every month for life. So. What are you waiting for? Go ahead and get started on your journey into Japan through snacks. 
So now let's move on to the karate school Danny mentioned. Because that karate school is, in fact, not a karate school at all. But rather, a pencak silat school called Merpati Putih. Which is one of the biggest pencak silat schools in Indonesia and the main reason I decided to make this video. And you're probably thinking, Kelly, how do you know for sure? Well, while I was re-watching his video and actually paying full attention to it and not having it on in the background while I do other stuff like I normally do, which is also the reason why it took me so long to notice, I finally realized how familiar the uniform looked, especially the logo, which was a white dove with the words Merpati Puti literally written on it. Duh. The gigantic logo was literally staring me in the face, hanging on the wall of the gym. And I was, all I could do was be like, hmm, this looks really familiar. I feel like I know this. And as proof that I was an MP student once, here I am wearing the uniform in present day. I even have the letterman jacket that the competitive team wore, but I'll get to that in a second. But guess what? This jacket it was actually signed by the cast of The Raid 2, including Iko Uwais himself, and I was so excited because he is literally my childhood hero and current hero right now, I think. Also, what is it with me and constantly getting myself in these crazy psychic training experiences? <laughs> a manifestation, maybe? I, I brought that into reality. But I swear, Danny's video was one giant call-out video to me personally. But anyway, getting back to Merpati Puti and Pencak Silat in general, to provide some context in case you're not familiar with it, it is an Indonesian martial art that is considered one of the most deadly martial arts in the world due to its emphasis on not only taking opponents down, but also making sure they won't be able to get back up again, be it by straight up unaliving them or breaking limbs. A lot of Indonesian combat philosophies are like this, like the traditional Javanese blade Kris only being allowed to be drawn if it is able to draw blood. We're just hardcore like that, man. Nobody bats an eye. It's one of the reasons why Indonesian Special Forces or Kopassus is considered one of the deadliest Special Forces team in the world. If you want to see Pencak Silat in action, I highly recommend checking out the Raid movies, starring Iko Weiss, of course. Though it is very gory, so if you're squeamish, you should probably skip it. But not all Pencak Silat schools try to turn their disciples into dangerous killing machines, okay? The brutal stuff is mostly reserved for military training and schools like Tiga Berantai. But Merpati Putih is considered, well, the gentle Pencak Silat school, hence its name, White Dove, which is mostly focused on self-defense. Pencak Silat is very deeply ingrained into Indonesian culture and cultural practices. It seeps into traditional dances and religious practices too. So Pencak Silat isn't just a martial art to us, it's part of our cultural expression and belief. Hence why it is arguably so entangled and inseparable from the concept of spirituality and the supernatural. A big part of Silat is meditation, strength training, and breathing techniques. Yes, just like in Demon Slayer. In fact, exactly like Demon Slayer. I've heard stories of Marpati Puti masters and alumni who can sense danger like Spider-Man and hit people without ever making physical contact with them, using just their energy and getting an instant knockout. I've actually had one of the masters do like use energy on me where they were like hovering their hand on my back and not touching me but it felt like they were pushing onto me or you know whatever this is Widodo. 
national event, by the way, streamed live on national television. And it also broke a lot of records for how many bricks you can smash at once. This platform was literally 26 meters tall. So, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's literally real, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> literally, most Silat demonstrations are like this. It's, it's usually a bunch of guys like laying on beds of nails and walking over hot coals completely unscathed or bending knives on their abdomens through sheer breath and muscle contraction. So yeah, there's a lot of, I don't know, crazy shit involved when it comes to silat and like Indonesian culture especially. A lot of weird things happen here, okay? But that's in Indonesia, right? The source and origin of Silat and Merpati Puti. I don't know how much of that actually gets carried over to the Silat branches in America, especially Utah, if it does at all. I was actually really surprised to see that there were any Merpati Puti branches at all outside of Indonesia. I have to imagine that they only teach the physical self-defense aspects of Pencak Silat and I can't help but wonder if this whole blindfold reading and navigation through a grocery store thing is this particular American branch's attempt at reconciling the spiritual aspect of Silat. The point I'm trying to make is, it's a very slippery slope from spirituality and cultural differences to goop but that's just a theory a game theory anyway the reason i joined marpati puti was pretty straightforward self-defense and continuing the theme from before my child self being fully determined to be an action hero one day a superhero i don't know i was weird okay so naturally i took a lot and i meant every martial art class i could I'd taken Aikido, Taekwondo, Tai Chi because my school offered it at the time and I thought it would be self-defense related and not wellness and slow and boring. And Wushu, which was kind of like Tai Chi but way more exciting because you actually got to practice moves and like flip around in the air. And I actually won second place for that particular school of Wushu's national meet as well. I was trained with the spear, not to brag or anything. And Pencak Silat was my latest endeavor. But don't be too impressed with this repertoire, because the reason I learned so many different martial arts wasn't because I was a child prodigy that mastered them right away. I just had the attention span of a goldfish and would get bored of my classes after a month or two and never come back. But when I was a part of Marpati Puti, and this must have been when I was 13 or 14, they do have blindness training where you had to close your eyes sometimes with a blindfold, and jog on an open field at the same time as everyone else. So it was like, it was almost like a free-for-all. And you're just not supposed to bump into anyone by dodging. So it's meant to train our dodging. And it, it, it was more about spatial awareness and honing your other senses, like hearing, I guess. We never did any blindfold reading like in the video. But aside from that, what I mostly remembered in Silat training was being made to run way too many laps for warm-ups, being taught how to breathe, and there was a lot of breathing because it was like the core and foundation of like striking and defending yourself against strikes, which helped like direct your energy. And being made to stay in a horse stance for way too long and then being twisted into pretzels to improve flexibility which I have already completely lost at my wise old age of 24 by the way but then I only attended that particular class like twice before one of the coaches who also happened to be my dad's friend who was like a national coach was like Hey, can I put your daughter on the competitive team preparing for PON, aka Indonesian National Sports Week, which is the equivalent of the Olympics, but on a national level? That's like 
competing in a national karate tournament in Japan. And dude, competitive training was hell and irrelevant to the psychic powers training because we stopped all that nonsense in favor of memorizing moves. So I'll spare you the details. Uh, but I will say, I was training every single day. Like, the classes started at around 6 p.m. So after coming home from school, I'd like go home, eat early dinner, get rested, and then leave for these training courses. This happened Monday to Friday. I think even Saturday and Sunday. Sa yeah, no, Saturday and Sunday was even worse because you had like the full day just training. And I was just incredibly sore all the time. And I distinctly remember consistently getting told off for skipping days because I, I, w I don't know what to tell you, man. I, I came here expecting one thing and, and I was thrust into something else. So I never made it to pawn because I quit halfway in. Although I will say that the reason I quit was because I didn't end up learning any self-defense or the cool tenaga dalam, which is like the, the psychic telekinetic powers I was talking about. And so let's leave it at that. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in the pond for a while. I hope your skin didn't get too pruney. Big shout out to my lovely pond dwellers and I just want to say welcome to all the new patrons. You guys are amazing and thank you so much for supporting me. If you want to become a pond dweller and get early access to my content as well as a bunch of really cool free stuff, then join my Patreon. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all my social media. If you want to submit fan art or chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want more of my stories, check out my Wild Word series here on YouTube because that will make me really happy. All the links are in my description and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!